There are many ways that statistics can be misleading. Firstly, governments can just outright lie and make up their own statistics. When Argentinian inflation was too high, the government just told the statistics agency to reduce the inflation rate. Problem solved. In Soviet times, local authorities would fall over themselves trying to prove that iron production had quadrupled in the past five years. When Chinese youth unemployment rose to uncomfortably high levels, they simply stopped producing the statistic. Of course, advanced Western economies would never put pressure on federal agencies to make the government look good. Now, in the UK, I find the ONS generally quite good, um, but they're not immune from problems. I recently reported on a massive increase in the number of people not working at all. It looked a really interesting statistic, almost shocking. But later I found out it was probably due to a lot of dodgy data. Resolution Foundation argued it was kind of misleading. Now, this is not a conspiracy by the ONS, more incompetence. To produce this data, they rely on labour market surveys. But since COVID, response rates have fallen to 17%. So you have a lot of unreliable uh, data, which is actually a big problem when you're trying to work out the state of a labour market and the economy. But it's not just governments who can produce dodgy data. This is Jordan Peterson saying that he thinks inflation in the US is actually much higher. And he's using shadow stats, which is an alternative measure of inflation. Basically, shadow stats say US inflation is not reliable because in 1980, they changed their methodology. Now, it is true in 1980, they did change their methodology. But the Bureau of Labour say it only basically reduced inflation rate by about 0.4% a year. But if you look at shadow stats, their own methodology, basically they're just kind of making it up. There's a huge fudge factor making inflation 5 or 6% higher with no real uh, statistical basis behind it. And when it comes to inflation, you know, if you don't trust government or private bodies, there are you know, independent private bodies looking at inflation, things like the Billion Price Index, which measures online prices. Even if the government did start to fiddle the inflation figures, it's pretty easy for market investors to actually know what is going on. But inflation definitely is one statistic where there's a lot of scepticism. At least in part, this is because there are many different ways to measure it. We have a huge number of inflation measures. No wonder there's a bit of scepticism. At the moment in the UK, headline inflation 3%, service sector inflation 5%, and owner-occupying housing costs rising at 8% a year. The inflation rate can also depend on who you are. If you're low income and old and energy prices go up, your effective inflation rate can actually be higher than the statistic produced uh, by the uh, ONS. But what I really want to talk about today is the selective use of data to prove a particular point. And it's particularly apt for a, a media framework which can reward you for producing content which pushes a certain narrative. Today, I'd like to do something a little bit different. I'd like to try to produce um, a very short presentation, but actually the UK economy is doing really well. See how convincing it is. In the past few decades, the UK economy has tripled in size, giving average households significantly higher income. In 1955, GDP per capita was 10,000. Today, it is over 30,000. The past century has also seen a huge reduction in wealth inequality. Back in 1902, the top 10% owned 92% of the nation's wealth. Today, it is 58%. In the past 23 years, we've also seen a significant reduction in income inequality. Some claim housing is expensive in the UK, but since 2007, Real house prices have fallen by 20%. And since the early 1990s, the amount that young people have to spend on housing has stayed pretty constant at just less than 30% of income. Not only that, but the UK has made tremendous progress in reducing unemployment. In the 90s, it averaged around 10%. Today, it's close to full employment, around 4.4%. The rise in GDP and strong performance meant that in 2023, the UK had the fastest economic growth in the European G7 since 2010. It's enabled the UK to spend more on healthcare. In 1900, it was £700 per person. In 2024, it's risen to 3000 As well as spending more on healthcare, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of people going to university. 
I could go on, but you get the idea. And by the way, none of this is using tricks like just using nominal figures or something like that. But let's take a look at what I've just said in more detail and try to unravel it. Firstly, no one is going to argue that life was better than 100 years ago. 1900, if you're made up and employed, you may end up in a workhouse. But comparing the past 100 years is not really very helpful for what's been happening in the past decade. If we take GDP, firstly, the statistic produced by HM and Treasury is a little bit misleading because UK GDP rose a lot. But if you look at GDP per capita, then it's much smaller because it's had a big increase in the population. Secondly, um, although GDP is higher than 1955, the big story of the UK economy is this lost uh, growth. We're no longer growing at the trend rate we used to grow, leading to around eight, ten thousand 10,000 lost per household. And that's really a better understanding of what's happened in the past 10, 15 years. It's the same with wealth inequality. 1900 was a time of lords of the manor, the aristocracy, doffing your cap. And the fact that inequality is better than 1900 doesn't really say very much. What's more revealing is the increase in inequality in the past couple of decades, especially a problem given that uh, many people with no wealth have seen stagnant incomes, but rising housing costs. And also, of course, data might miss quite a lot with the case of uh, wealthy people. There's good evidence that uh, a lot of it is hidden in offshore tax uh, schemes, so it's not giving a full picture of what's actually going on. What about the statistic that uh, the share of income spent on housing has been fairly constant for young people? Well, this is a classic example of data only showing part of the story. What's happening is actually more complex. Basically, 30% is roughly a kind of maximum of what people can spend on rent. So as rents and house prices increase, young people have had to accept smaller house sizes or live with more people. Private renters under 45 have much less space than they did in the 1990s. Also in the 1990s, young people might have been um, spending 30% of their income on their mortgage payments, which is helping them to buy a house and get equity and wealth for the future. Today, they're spending 30% of their income on a five-person house share and maybe have to commute further afield to get to work. Also, it is true real house prices have fallen. But compared to incomes, house prices are closest to the all-time record. And this is what's actually important, not real prices, but can you afford to buy a house? True, we spend more on healthcare than ever before, but also we have close to record waiting lists. And this means more to most people. Not how much government spends, but can you actually get treated? Now, why is this important for a place like YouTube? Well, take this video I did recently, how badly is the UK economy doing? YouTube liked it, 195k views, and they showed it to 2.8 million people. Now, this is a different kind of video, good economic news you've probably never heard of. It received about 2,000 views and 32,000 impressions. Now, admittedly, it was a time when I had fewer subscribers, but I'm sure from your own feed, you get bombarded with kind of doom and gloom videos and good economic videos and good news stories you probably may never see anyway. So there is a subtle pressure to make videos to fit in with what uh, does well. Now, the way I try to cope with the algorithm is to make the video that I want to make and then decide the title which will help it to do well. Now, my recent video on is inflation going to increase? It's quite balanced about whether inflation will go up or go down. I've got no particular vested interest in trying to push one cause. But if I'd produced a one-sided video, you know, inflation is higher than what they're telling you and inflation is going to increase definitely, it may well have got more uh, clicks. We'll never know, but that's my feeling. I often joke to myself that the ideal title for YouTube is things are really bad, but they will get worse. Now, of course, the other approach is not to use any statistic at all. Just go on feeling I feel this. And, you know, so, so some people probably do quite well from that. But it is useful to actually check statistics sometimes because sometimes I'm researching a video and a statistic is not what I expected. So, for example, I had assumed that the labour share of income in the UK would have fallen in recent years. But actually, it's a pretty constant. There's a whole range of reasons for that. Firms not doing well, more pensions, etc. But uh, we won't get into that now. Anyway, talking about clickbait videos. We're all doomed, Captain Manning, doomed, I tell you. Check out this video on why the next crash 
maybe the worst ever, or maybe not.